to this presentation uh, on diabetic ketoacidosis for the MDM158, the um, acute and emergency pediatrics module as part of the master's program at BSMS. So uh, we're going to start with uh, just a little explanation about diabetic ketoacidosis. So as the uh, title suggests, there's three elements to the condition. One being diabetic, which means having an insufficiency of insulin, which prevents glucose from entering cells and therefore your cells starve. And as a result of that intracellular starvation, an alternative source of energy, which is, as you can see in the pictogram at the top, um, derived from fat, and that causes the buildup of ketones, uh, ketones being highly acidotic, uh, and therefore you have ketones causing acidosis as the main part of the problem in the condition. And as a result of the increased glucose in the tissues and in the blood, there's an osmotic diuresis which causes dehydration, which further worsens the acidosis and causes additional derangement. The um, other pictures on the top right hand, you can see that we're going to use the NICE guideline including an update in 2016 looking at the management of diabetes in children and young people. The child in the bottom left is a typical patient with uh, severe diabetic ketoacidosis receiving some oxygen, looking a little bit pale and maybe a bit drowsy. And as you can see in this particular photograph, there appears to be uh, someone bolusing by hand a syringe full of fluid, which I'm going to argue is not necessarily the best thing to do. And finally, the picture on the bottom right uh, is symbolic of the actual management that uh, we're going to discuss about in DKA as in it and it's meant to be a stark contrast to the picture on the left, which shows a bit more of an aggressive approach. What we'll uh, do is go through some of the definitions, a bit about how we might uh, diagnose diabetic ketoacidosis um, and the definitions of that. Some initial management and what NICE says, particularly around fluids and insulins. Um, the difficulties of dehydration assessment and the single largest cause of mortality in diabetic ketoacidosis cerebral edema and then finish off with a, a few small miscellaneous. So the uh, top right hand pictogram sh shows the symptoms and signs related to diabetic ketoacidosis. So the ones on the left are more around diabetes and the ones on the right are the key ones related to ketoacidosis. And some of the interventions that uh, you may be familiar with uh, if you're used to treating children with this condition are uh, represented in the bottom right hand corner. And before we proceed with anything, I want to draw your attention really to this concept that uh, there are a number of features that are shared by the two different conditions. Shock, whether it be septic or cardiogenic or otherwise, and diabetic ketoacidosis. And these two Venn diagrams, the one on the right showing the signs and symptoms of diabetic ketoacidosis and the ones on the left showing those of shock and the overlap. And you can see there's a large number of signs and symptoms, neurological, cardiovascular, respiratory, um, and in particular the acidosis, which all overlap between the two. 
And so it's quite easy, I think, psychologically to be thinking of treating shock and the way we approach shock when we're treating a child with DKA. And of course, the two approaches are actually really quite distinctly different. Um, and that's part of the theme for today's presentation. So let's start with defining and diagnosing. So I actually hadn't realised, I must admit, before I started um, looking up things for this presentation, that there isn't a universally accepted definition. So therefore, what NICE have recommended is that a combination of three things. Evidence that you may have diabetes in the form of hyperglycemia, and they define that as a BM more than 11 millimoles. Evidence of acidosis, which can be either in the form of a pH of less than 7.3 and a bicarbonate less than 18. And furthermore, they go on to define severe DKA as someone with a pH of less than 7.1. And then lastly, evidence that there's ketosis and ideally that would be in the blood with a level of more than 0.6 millimoles per litre. Uh, but if that equipment isn't available or that test isn't so readily available, then evidence that it's in the urine and that might be more pertinent, for example, in primary care settings. Um, and it's important also to think about when really we should be suspecting it. And in particular, the caveat that you don't always have to have evidence of hyperglycemia. Um, so, for example, in gastroenteritis in children with diabetes, the lack of sugar going into the blood from the bowel may, for example, be a reason for hyperglycemia not to be particularly pronounced. But the presence of nausea or vomiting uh, or abdominal pain or hyperventilation or dehydration, and in particular any reduced level of consciousness, especially in any child known to be diabetic, one should suspect the diagnosis regardless. Um, so once having suspected clinically the diagnosis, uh, NICE have reviewed the evidence to see if there are any new tests available for helping us diagnose DKA. And in particular, they've looked at measuring blood ketones in the form of hydroxybutyrate or beta-hydroxybutyrate and evidence or indirect evidence of acidosis in the form of reduced N-tidal CO2. So here's uh, the summary taken directly out of the NICE guideline update in 2015 in the management of diabetes in children. And I want to draw your attention initially to the right hand column, looking at the quality of the data in studies. And you can see that there's a couple of moderate quality studies and only one which is designated as high quality. And the reason that the designated is either moderate, low, or very low is partly due to the fact that um, the retrospective studies. So, for example, the first study, um, although it shows an apparently useful sensitivity and specificity for the cutoff of hydroxybutyrate of more than three millimoles per litre in detecting DKA, uh, because it was a retrospective study, it's quality of evidence is clearly very low because of the risk of bias. And this really is actually borne out if we look at the uh, prospective studies, um, which have a more moderate quality, uh, but relatively lowish numbers. Um, they show a less useful sensitivity and in particular, a less useful negative likelihood ratio, meaning that it's not a great test at picking up possible cases, but more importantly, a level of less than three millimole per litre is not useful for ruling out DKA. So you can have DKA with lower levels. And at the bottom, you can see there is one high quality study for n tidal CO2, 
suggesting that uh, a level of 36 millimeters of mercury, which equates to 4.8 kilopascal, is highly sensitive, but really not all that specific. Um, and that a level of 30, sorry, um, uh, millimeters of mercury, which would be a cutoff of 4 kilopascal, still is quite highly specific. Um, but becomes more sensitive. However, the nature of the data is that it's low quality. So really, no great progress in terms of defining diabetic ketoacidosis by any other means than the ones we've already discussed in the previous slide. Nice comments uh, about the initial management. Uh, for diabetic ketoacidosis, and they recommend certain criteria that if you're younger than two years of age or the severity of acidosis is uh, a pH of below 7.1, that patients really require HDU type nursing and almost one to one because of the frequency of testing and the high risk of. Um, mortality and morbidity, particularly with cerebral edema, possibility of aspiration, uh, pneumonia, etc. And because it's recognised that aspiration pneumonia is a real risk and a, cause, a known cause of mortality in DKA, the assertion that a nasogastric tube really should be considered if there's a reduced level of consciousness and vomiting. That in such patients, an urgent anaesthetic review and also discussion, early discussion with pediatric intensive care retrieval services uh, should be instigated if there's a reduced level of consciousness and to consider inotropic support in conjunction with discussion uh, with PICU if there's hypotensive shock. It's very uncommon to get hypotensive shock because the incidence of sepsis is actually very low in children, uh, but much higher in adult patients. There's a recommendation to consider the possibility of sepsis in the presence of fever or hypothermia. So that's really a kind of mental prompt to at least think about it, particularly if there's hypotension. They mention the idea of refractory acidosis, and this is going to be covered in a little bit more detail in the acid-base balance lecture, but it's a difficult concept uh, and potentially confusing, and you'll see a bit more about that in that lecture. And what they have added in is if there's evidence of lactic acidosis to definitely consider um, shock uh, in terms of either sepsis or as a result of an intra-abdominal pathology. So, um, NICE reviewed these four questions and the next series of slides are going to talk through uh, what evidence they've reviewed regarding the rate of fluid and that children should be rehydrated, what type of fluid uh, should be used, so what should be the contents in terms of our, uh, electrolytes, glucose, uh, when we're rehydrating children and young people with DKA, when uh, the intravenous insulin should be started and at what rate this should be. So the NICE group initially identified eight priority outcomes, uh, but they decided that there was insufficient evidence uh, for all of them, and so they included the mo most important seven. And these include, so mortality, time to resolution of dehydration, 
the rate of change in blood glucose concentration, so how quickly glucose comes down, how quickly the acidosis improves, what change in chloride concentration has happened, and the side effect or um, uh, known complication, uh, if you may, of diabetic ketoacidosis, which is cerebral edema. And there are numerous factors that have been implicated in the pathophysiology, uh, but really none have been definitively proven. And these factors include processes of ischemia, basogenic cerebral edema, osmotic, and cytotoxic processes. And it's possible that in DKA, cerebral edema is related to a combination of two or more of these factors. And furthermore, other metabolic and inflammatory factors, for example, hyperglycemia-induced increased blood-brain barrier permeability and the generation of new solutes within the brain by hyperglycemia itself and by insulin therapy may contribute to its pathogenesis. And we know that clinically significant cerebral edema occurs in approximately 1% of DKA in children and has a mortality of between 20 and 50%. Um, so an important outcome. And then looking, they also looked at the change in serum, sodium, and where possible, how much healthcare utilisation, i.e. things like, did they step up to intensive care? And that was as a proxy for assessing the severity of illness. So the first criteria they looked at to judge against all these outcomes um, of fluid. And here is uh, a cup, some of the sort of summaries of evidence that they looked at. And in particular, they looked at the odds ratio for cerebral edema in patients given higher fluid quantities. And there's when one main study you can see there on the left by Dr. Julie Edge in 2006 and her group based at Oxford. And that really was quite seminal because it informed really a significant change in UK paediatric practice. And you can see there that the first row of that study, which includes 43 cases of cerebral edema and 169 controls, has an odds ratio of 3.30, but that the confidence interval crosses one so it's from 0 0.71 to 15.27, which means that uh, the estimate for the odds ratio is not s soundly above one uh, because the confidence interval increases, uh, sorry, crosses below the level of one. And this looked at children who received between 512 to 879 mils in the first four hours compared to those children who received between 76 and 511 mils in the first four hours. Um, so, in effect, the difference between those two groups isn't particularly large. And it's not large enough for the odds ratio confidence interval to stay above one. But when they compared even larger volumes of fluid. So if they compared the group of children that, who in the first four hours received between 892 and 4,000 mils compared to the group that received between 76 and 500 mils, you can see that the odds ratio is significantly larger at 6.55, which means that the mean estimate is that the group who received a greater amount of fluid 6.5 times more likely to get cerebral edema and the confidence intervals. Quite large range, you can see from 1.38 to 30.97 means uh, that the low number of patients uh, is the reason for such a large spread in the confidence interval, but it does not cross one. So there's enough precision in the estimate that it's likely to be true. And that was really kind of 
one of the first pieces of evidence to suggest that greater amounts of fluid are detrimental in the management of DKA. So of course that begs the next question, if you look of slower fluid rates, does that uh, show any different perspective? And there was really only one study that they were able to find looking at slower fluid rates compared to higher fluid rates specifically. Um, and what the in this study, the outcome did not include the rate of cerebral edema, but they did look at um, how quickly the acidosis uh, resolved. And they did look also to see if there was any increased need for ICU, any changes in sodium or chloride. And um, the fluid regimes that they used in this study was a calculation of the lower rate uh, being two and a half times maintenance in 24 hours. And so, for example, for a 20 kilogram child, this would equate to 78 mils an hour. And in the faster rate of fluid group, the calculation was based on 10% dehydration plus one and a half times maintenance, half of which was given in the first 12 hours. And so for a 20 kilogram child, this equates to 152 mils an hour, almost twice as much uh, as the low rate group. And what they showed was that the main outcome was that there was a statistically significant difference in the slower group were two to 5.8 hours quicker in resolution of acidosis. However, the quality of this study is very low, and so it's a hint rather than anything definitive. So in sort of summary, we have some evidence to show that increased cerebral edema risk if you have too great a fluid rate, but how do we define too great um, isn't clear from the evidence. And there's no specific evidence to show that a slower fluid rate is uh, safer, um, but it, there's a hint that it might uh, reduce the time taken to resolve acidosis. Now, we know that the rate of fluid is kind of dependent on assessing the severity of dehydration, and there are some real significant problems um, with assessing dehydration not just in DKA, but additionally in DKA. So firstly, we know that um, children uh, under five nice looked at the assessment of uh, dehydration using clinical signs, and really their conclusion was that it was only possible to distinguish those with either no evidence of dehydration between uh, that group and those who had some evidence and those who had very pronounced findings suggesting imminent or actual hypovolemic shock. So the precision of our estimate of severity of dehydration is really very poor if you use signs. And the clinical manifestation of dehydration is even more difficult to interpret in DKA. So for example, urine output is maintained even in severe dehydration in DK because of the osmotic diuresis. One of the commonly used signs, dry mucous membranes, can be an issue uh, in interpretation in DK because the mouth may be dry due to hyperventilation associated with the acidosis rather than as a result of the dehydration. And the trouble is the acidosis itself leads to peripheral vasoconstriction and that prolongs capillary refill time, which is one of the other normally considered indicators for severe dehydration. And even more troubling is that you can't rely on the gold standard for assessing dehydration, which, you, for example, you would use in someone with diarrhea and vomiting, uh, which is weight loss, uh, to calculate the percentage of dehydration, because in DKA the weight loss in part is tissue 
weight loss from catabolism due to insulin deficiency, as well as fluid loss. And so you're always going to overestimate the dehydration. So kind of taking a more pragmatic view, uh, NICE have suggested that um, an assumption be made of moderate dehydration of 5% fluid deficit if the acidosis level is of a pH of 7.1 or below and assume 10% fluid deficit if the pH is below 7.1. Now, there isn't any strict evidence base for this, but you could argue that trying to simplify things to some degree means they're more likely to happen in this way and maybe there's a less tendency to give too much fluid in those who are only defined as moderately acidotic. And instead of correcting over a short period that the minimum correction time should be over 48 hours, and in particular to limit the use of bolusing of fluid um, to 10 mils per kilo and to really not even consider it as a matter of routine to do this even if the pH is less than 7.1. And furthermore, they suggest that using the calculation of almost half maintenance fluid uh, as the ongoing maintenance to be added to the deficit. And so that's covering the volume. If we move on now to what type of fluid, um, these are the outcomes on the left hand side and you can see here there are 13 that they were able to uh, prioritize and the way they did it was they looked at individual components and they were able to find evidence for three components, so sodium, bicarbonate and phosphate. And I can uh, tell you that there were three different interventions. So uh, one study compared the effect of different concentration of sodium. One study compared the effect of adding in phosphate compared to not adding in phosphate. That was back in 1983. And then there were five studies looking at the effect of adding bicarbonate versus not adding bicarbonate. And there was no evidence identified for addition of glucose or potassium to rehydration fluids. And there was no identified evidence looking at the outcomes of mortality, time to resolution of dehydration, or the change in the rate of glucose or the resolution of the acidosis. There was studies looking at uh, change in calcium related to phosphate, change in sodium and carbon dioxide if there was additional sodium added in, and uh, importantly, cerebral edema when looking at bicarbonate. Uh, so essentially, there were no difference in outcomes when they looked at fluids which contained 75 millimoles per litre versus 100 millimoles per litre uh, of sodium, and there was certainly no difference if there was additional phosphate added in. So the main evidence is really around bicarbonate and cerebral edema. So there are three studies, um, and you can see that, unfortunately, they're all very low quality. A total of 950 participants um, found a statistically significant increased risk of cerebral edema in young children with DKA who received bicarbonate compared to, compared to those who didn't. And the reasons for the very low quality is because they were either retrospective or just case controlled but not randomised or blinded in any way. There was one study with 244 participants, which was thought to be of moderate uh, quality, which did find a statistically significant increase, so an odds rate, a relative ratio 
relative risk ratio of 4.2 uh, between 1.5 and 12 of, of cerebral edema in children who received bicarbonate. And this really has informed our practice quite significantly. So therefore it's not surprising that NICE recommends that no bicarbonate should be used in the treatment of DK. They further go on to say that 0.9% saline is the fluid of choice and to add in potassium as early as is safely possible um, and that's because of the associated risks of cardiac arrhythmias and significant muscular weakness with potassium levels less than 3. To also add in 5% uh, glucose and also when to increase it, which is if the BMs fall from 14 towards 6, so to increase to 10%, or if the insulin is required to be increased because acidosis or the ketoacidosis is not resolving. However, my my personal worry is that um, this overlooks the possibility that a child presenting with DKA starts with ketoacidosis and with the use of high chloride containing intravenous fluids we replace one type of acidosis with another which is from ketoacidosis to hypochloremic and that the resulting persistence of acidosis leads to confusion as to whether the ketoacidosis is resolving or not because we don't always have a way of differentiating what the cause of the acidosis is. Uh, this, however, will be covered in more detail in the acid-base balance talk and the importance of this uh, it will be very clear after that. So, moving on from composition, uh, of, we next come to the question of when should insulin be started? And this summary here shows that with two moderate, well, uh, two different assessments that of the same study, that certainly there is an associated uh, association between the timing of insulin therapy and the risk of cerebral edema, particularly if the adjustment is made for the severity of acidosis at the time of presentation. So you can see on the bottom line there, there's a 12-fold increase in the rate of cerebral edema in those given insulin before one hour as opposed to waiting for at least an hour. And that estimate is between 1 and 100. Uh, it would be useful to have even larger numbers of patients, obviously, to narrow that estimate down, but it clearly does not cross one and so the precision of this estimate is good enough to give recommendations by the NICE team and I would say that there's compelling evidence to withhold insulin for at least an hour and NICE recommends starting between two hours after fluid. So once we've decided when we're going to give fluid, the next question of what rate uh, we should give. And there are three retrospective cohort studies uh, which were identified. And all of them looked at DK in type 1 diabetes. And they compared 0.05 units per kilo per hour to 0.1 units per kilo per hour, which had been the previous standard practice. The guideline development group recognised that using that kind of 0.1 unit per kilo per hour is quite widespread and appears to be safe and effective, and that there were some centres using 0.05. And again, the experience appeared to be that this was safe and effective, but there was limited evidence from comparative studies 
to determine what is optimal. And you can see from the summary of the evidence of comparing different regimes that the quality of the studies are all uh, very low and really therefore there's a lack of evidence regarding the relative risks of adverse events such as cerebral edema or hypoglycemia or hypokalemia uh, when you compare 0.025 or 0.05 with 0.1 unit per kilo per hour. So there's no known optimum, but between 0 0.5 and 0 0.1 unit per kilo per hour is thought to be safe, so that's what we continue. And it's worth just reminding ourselves why insulin is given in DKA, and it isn't to reduce primarily the sugar, but it's role is to stop ketosis and therefore if there's persisting ketosis then you need to continue giving the insulin and if the glucose levels drop then to give glucose to allow insulin to be continued and if there isn't a drop in the ketone levels measured by blood beta hydroxy butyrate within six to eight hours then to consider increasing the insulin dose to at least 0.1 units per kilo per hour, or sometimes a little bit greater. And they recommend probably waiting six to eight hours because uh, the greatest risk for developing cerebral edema appears to be between four and 12 hours, and it is really associated with too much fluid. And if you wait for an hour before you give your insulin, then that seems to reduce the risk related to insulin in causing cerebral edema. So we've covered how much, what rate of fluid to give, when to start the insulin, and the fact there's not much evidence to tell us how, what rate of insulin to give. We move to looking for evidence, any new evidence about how we should be monitoring differently to before uh, I want to talk about the evidence review of the effectiveness of treatment of cerebral edema and a few other miscellaneous recommendations. So they were able to look to see if there's any evidence indicated that blood monitoring of beta hydroxybutyrate was preferable to urine, uh, clearly because in theoretical terms urine uh, ketones persist after the resolution of blood ketosis and therefore uh, tracking acidosis requires particular interpretation, especially with the use of 0.9% saline as I've said before, which causes ketoacidosis to sometimes be replaced by hypochloremic acidosis. So if we measure the levels of ketones, then of course um, our assessment of the ketosis is more accurate. Uh, but unfortunately, the numbers in the patient uh, study that was of high quality were so low that there was no real conclusion to be had. So the jury is still out on that. If we then now move on to uh, cerebral edema and the treatment of cerebral edema. So the uh, quality of studies here you can see are very low and because of that although they suggested in this 1500 patient review that the mortality was slightly higher in the hypertonic saline group this was not um, st statistically significant uh, because of the quality. And so there's nothing obvious to decide between mannitol and hypertonic saline. And in terms of effectiveness, 
And so the guideline group um, you know, mentioned that uh, mannitol is a commonly used uh, treatment for cerebral edema and that perhaps it's more available in ICU than it is on wards and that hypertonic saline is um, more readily available and in some units tends to be recommended as first-line treatments for cerebral edema regardless of the etiology. And theoretically there's one possible benefit of hypertonic saline compared to mannitol in that it can be given repeatedly whereas repeated doses of mannitol become less effective. So overall conclusion it doesn't really matter which one you choose because there isn't any strong evidence one way or the other. So what they do suggest is when to suspect cerebral edema. We know that it's most likely to occur between 4 and 12 hours after initiation of therapy, but may occur any time within the first 24 hours. It rarely has developed prior to initiation of therapy and has rarely happened after the first 24 hours. And although therapy is thought to perhaps exacerbate the pathological processes leading to cerebral edema, it's not, therapy itself is not thought to initiate these pathological processes. So any patient with headache, agitation or irritability, an unexpected fall in heart rate, one of the sort of Cushing's triads, or increase in blood pressure, um, it should prompt a thought about suspecting cerebral edema. And there's no benefit in using CT scan. The evidence for using CT scan in diagnosing cerebral edema is uh, very low. So you're really going on clinical grounds, and they recommend, therefore, to immediately treat if a child has deterioration in the level of consciousness, any abnormalities of breathing patterns, which would suggest the beginnings of herniation, any ocular motor pauses, um, and any pupillary inequality of dilatation. So that would be third nerve involvement from herniation of the falx. Now, coming towards the end of the presentation, there are a couple of uh, miscellaneous uh, recommendations. One, they suggest even stopping insulin and talking to PICU if the potassium falls below 3 millimoles per litre because of the risks of cardiac arrhythmias and severe muscular weakness. There's a caveat that there is an increased risk of thrombus associated with DKA, presumably related to the degree of dehydration, and this is particularly well recognised in adult patients. Therefore, there's, you know, by extrapolation, likely to be a risk in children. Um, but there's no evidence to use to decide whether any preventative strategies are required. But just to be aware, particularly with children with central lines, there is this increased risk. And of course, just a little reminder, we don't know what the optimum insulin regime is. There are no studies done to look specifically at is 0 0.025 better than 0 0.05 or is 0 0.05 better than 0 0.1 unit per kilo per hour in terms of safety, efficacy, effectiveness, uh, etc. So this has been a, a kind of run through in how NICE recommend assessing severity, so that whether the pH is 7.1 or below, uh, a review of the evidence for how much and which fluid to use, in particular the recommendation of not using bicarbonate, of when to start insulin and the recommendation of delaying by an hour. discussed a little bit about the potential usefulness of monitoring ketones and they've recommended that 
beta hydroxy butyrate be actually measured at diagnosis and again um, at six to eight hours to see that they're reducing. I want to highlight the issues around deciding whether acidosis is from ketoacidosis or from hypochloremic acidosis uh, because that can clearly lead to significant over-treatment with fluid which in itself then worsens the acidosis and as we know too much fluid causes cerebral edema. So hopefully um, now you might begin to recognize the symbolism of the photograph on the left, the uneventful steady recovery from DK, from cautious fluid therapy, from delayed insulin and appropriate monitoring. And that this is despite the overlap of signs and symptoms with shock that would normally entice us to be perhaps more aggressive with, with uh, our resuscitation. And so in comparison to managing shock, it could be seen as a bit more boring, longer, straighter road and those are kind of the human factors element to be mindful of. So on that note, I'm going to end this presentation and uh, thank you very much for listening.